theyeshiva.net. Ladies and gentlemen, Rabbi Jacobson. Thank you so much, Anita, for those uh, extraordinary stories and the incredible narrative of your life and your survival and that you're here with us today to share the story unlike six million of your sisters and brothers who have perished and were murdered so brutally. We must, us, the younger generation, those who grew up in freedom and prosperity in countries that have given us the opportunity to live, breathe, be Jewish with joy and happiness and opportunity, ought to never take for granted what our parents, grandparents, great-grandparents have endured and have given up for us to be able to be Jewish today. And you and your story are a real source of inspiration and blessing to all of us. Thank you. I want to begin by thanking the Buzaglo family for giving me this privilege here to address you tonight. When Shlomo brought up the suggestion the first time to his father a few months ago, his father, Reb Shmuel Sam, said, I'll take care of the event. Sadly, Hoshina Rabbe, at the end of the holiday of Sukkot, Sam passed on suddenly, he was taken from us. And this evening is dedicated to his love, to his memory, to his passion. I wanna welcome all of his children who are here with us, Ruth and Esther and Jimmy and my dear friend Shlomo, the vice president of Petach Tikva, an ambitious, passionate Jew I'm sure your father is so proud of all of you and quelling from joy of how you continue his passion, his warmth and his love for his family, his love for the Jewish people, his love for the community, his love for the shul. And may his memory and inspiration continue to serve as a source of light and blessing to the entire family, children, grandchildren, and to the entire community and to all of the Jewish people. Amen. Amen. I and we are all so sorry for your loss. There's really few words to say. A young man, 67, suddenly <laughs> enjoying a wonderful horse race. And then on the way home, preparing for the holidays, was just plucked out like a rose plucked of a garden. And tonight's evening is dedicated in his great memory, loving memory and loving inspiration. Tehenish Mato, Tzura, Betzror HaChayim. My dear friends, the theme that was allotted to me this evening in this Holocaust Education Week here in Toronto was faith and the Holocaust. It's not a secret that the Holocaust, like so many other tragedies, but the magnitude of the tragedy of the Holocaust has raised many a question many a dilemma, some emotional, some theological, and usually a combination of so many different experiences and emotions. But one of the greatest and grandest questions is, where was God? If there is a God who exists, who cares for his world, who cares for his people, who supervises the world, where was this God? It's true. People sometimes tend to forget that God was not the perpetrator of the Holocaust. The Nazis were the perpetrator of the Holocaust. Hitler, Yemach Shemai, and the Nazi regime 
with the participation of so many ordinary citizens in Germany with the perpetrators of this greatest crime against humanity in the history of civilization, the black hole of human history, the black hole of Jewish history. And yet, for the person who embraces the conviction, one of the pillars of Judaism, that ultimately God is in charge of this world, that there is providence in this world, that God orchestrates events even as he allows free choice. Is there a limit? Is there no limit? How could have God watched this happen? The very well-known Holocaust survivor, Elie Wiesel, Eli Wiesel, who died some two years ago, who was in Auschwitz, Buchenwald, I believe, He's a close friend to my family. And in his first book about the war, about the Holocaust night, he describes that day when in Auschwitz he saw a young Jewish child hanging from the gallows. And because of the lightness of his body, it took him such a long time to die. And at that moment, he says, he felt not only did he lose his people, did he lose this child, he also lost his God, his faith. Some 50 years later, I think it was, uh, uh, 50, 80, around 50 years later, I think it was 97 or 98, he wrote a piece in the New York Times, an op-ed piece in the New York Times on Rosh Hashanah, day before Rosh Hashanah. And the, the headline was, A Letter to God. In the letter he writes how it's been 50 years that I've been fighting with you. It's too long. I want to come home. It's time for reconciliation. It's time for forgiveness. He says, I still don't understand. I still have my questions. But we managed to rebuild our lives. And the reason I despised you so much is because I believed in you so much. I trusted you so much. I grew up in Sigit, Hasidic family, a Vizhnitz family, and I, I believed in you, I trusted you. How could you have let me and millions of your people down? And that letter that he published in the New York Times, it was such a powerful testimony of how Jews think. As he once said, Jews can either love God or despise God. They don't know how to ignore God. They tell the anecdote about uh, this father who sends his son to a prep school in Manhattan. He doesn't like the public school. So he sends him to a private prep school. It happens to be a Christian school. Very secular, assimilated Jewish family in New York City. The boy comes home the first day from this Christian prep school. Daddy says, David, how was the first day of school? He says, whoa, Daddy, we learned about all these new concepts. He says, really, like what? Mary, Trinity starts preaching the doctrines of the gospel to his father. Father picks up his son by the collar. He says, listen, David, I'm going to tell this to you once and only once. There is only one God, and we don't believe in him. <laughs> and and tr truth be told, that... Uh, Ultimately, nobody could tell anybody else what to believe. I've learned for many years of teaching and speaking around the world, people will believe what they choose to believe. People will believe what they choose to believe. I know a lot of friends who bought the lottery ticket for the mega 1.6 billion ticket. What were the chances? You too, right? You won? Did you win? Next time. Don't give up. What were the chances for them to win? Pretty slim, but they bought not one ticket, two tickets, three tickets. One in four people who text during driving get into an accident. One in four. Not one in 1.6 billion. One in four. How many people text? They say, it's not going to happen to me. 
The same people who buy lottery tickets believe they're going to win the lottery ticket. Believe they're not going to be one of four. Because people ultimately believe what they want to believe. That's the truth about life. Our belief system is usually not completely rational and objective and detached from any experiences and considerations. We are not detached from life. When one looks at the universe, when one studies the universe, one can argue for thousands of years, is there a creator or is it just a random mutation? There's the bar mitzvah boy who comes to his mother and says, Mom, at the bar mitzvah I want to speak about our origin, where we come from. Where do we come from? Mom says we come from this family, that family, this dynasty. No, 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 Ma, the beginning. Ah, Mom says the beginning, God created heaven and earth. On the sixth day, God created Adam and Eve. For some reason, they decided to have children. <laughs> Bad mistake. And the rest is history, or actually her story. That's where we come from. Comes to his father. Daddy, where do we come from? Oh, Daddy says, well, <coughs> the prebiotic soup exploded some 15.3 billion years ago. And things have evolved in over billions and millions of years. We've emerged. So, Daddy, where do we come from? This is where we've evolved from, who? from the apes. And where did the apes come from? They evolved from other primates. And where did they come from? They evolved and evolved. Ultimately, what does it begin with? It begins with gases and bacteria. Comes back to his mother, says, Mom, I'm really confused about my bar mitzvah speech. I want to talk about where we come from, but you tell me we come from God and Adam and Eve and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, Leah. God, Dad tells me we come from apes and monkeys, gas and bacteria. What should I say at the bar mitzvah? His mother says, son, there's no contradiction. Your father was talking about his side of the family. <laughs> You know, I'm talking about my side of the family. <laughs> Ultimately, people have argued about the existence of God for a very, very long time. And I'm not sure Rabbi Y.Y. Jacobson is going to solve <laughs> this problem and question here tonight with all due respect to myself at a wonderful lecture in Muncie. I know for myself, when I study and I observe the fact that every one of our bodies is made up of approximately 50 or 60 trillion cells working in perfect coordination with each other. Hundreds and millions of neurons. Hundreds and millions of neurons interacting with each other in the most incredible manner. When one studies the DNA, the genome that exists in each cell, and if we were just to be able to open up the DNA as a scroll, it would fill the height of the Empire State Building three times. And it's designed, it's programmed, it's information to say that this was just a random mistake, a random error. Doesn't seem that rational to me. When I observe the fact, if somebody were to ask you, pluck out a blade of grass, and if you get the right one, the world will survive. If not, the world will not be able to survive. Where is this blade of grass? Got to figure it out. And you manage to get the right blade of grass. And you have to do this 200,000 times and get the right one. And say it happened by mistake. Well, the factors, the chances that from the Big Bang, our universe like ours can be formed. And the chances that our planet should support life are more slim than the ability of a blind person doing the Rubik's Cube. You know that one? For 90 years and getting each one right every time baffles the imagination to say it just happened randomly. Rather, there's an intelligence, there's a conscious design there. Which is why I'm allergic to people who are supposed to be sophisticated and mock People who embrace the conviction that there is a consciousness at the core of the universe, that there is love at the core of the universe, as blind, as irrational. 
You could believe what you want, but don't tell me <laughs> that someone who thinks that Shakespeare was written by William Shakespeare and not by an avalanche of bottles of ink, and the bottles of ink just happened to form Romeo and Juliet and a merchant of Venice and Hamlet, and that's just one play, and the complexity of one living organism not millions, not billions, not one living organism is infinitely great, close to infinitely greater than all of the 32 plays. Did I get the number right? How many plays did Shakespeare write? Okay. You'll Google it. Put together. But this does not answer the question, the big question. This consciousness, this core, this divine core, we were conceived in love, we were conceived in purpose. How can he watch? How can he watch that happen? And the truth is at the end of the day, an argument this way, an argument that way, everybody ultimately has to choose the world you inhabit, the world you want to believe in, the world you want to bequeath to your children. Can I prove in a laboratory that humor exists? Is there such a thing as humor? Well, I know people who don't believe there's such a thing as humor. Can I prove in a laboratory there's such a thing as music? I once had a cynical friend who's told me there's no music. It's just a manipulation of notes. Can I argue? Can I prove in a laboratory that there's something called love? How can I prove it? Can you live without humor? Yes. Can you live without music? Yes. Can you live without love? Yes. But life is smaller. It's a smaller life. It's a much narrower life. I can live without humor. Maybe not me, but some people can live without humor. I mean, I gotta make a living, so <laughs> that's what I meant. <laughs> but if I win the lottery, I can also live without humor. I could try, I could try. I, I could try to be serious. Can one live without love? Yes. Can one live without music, without literature? Yes. But the life is, is a smaller life. It's a narrower life. It's a more diminished life. Can one live without God? Can love live without the belief that there's meaning, that there's purpose? Of course you could. But I think it's a smaller life. It's a narrower life. When I look at myself, I look at you, I look at my children, I look at the world and I say, sorry, you're all just a random error. Just an insignificant blimp on the surface of a planet that came here by mistake. Your life means nothing but to yourself. Your death means nothing but to yourself. Your conception of being part of a plan, of a picture, is nothing but a delusion. The God delusion in the famous book. You could believe that. I think life becomes smaller. It's diminished, it's very narrow. There's something very powerful, meaningful in teaching my children that their lives have meaning, that their lives have purpose, that they were conceived in love, that every soul was sent down for a mission, and that even every bee and every mosquito, every mammal and every fish, every bird and every gene, every shrub and every tree and every plant, every galaxy and every star, Every flake of snow, grain of sand, beating heart and blade of grass, every lily and rose ultimately sings a song, manifests an energy, and there is a cosmic oneness, a holistic oneness that connects us all. We speak especially today about all men and women being created equal. We're responsible to each other. That shouldn't be taken for granted. I know Jefferson from my country believed these are self-understood truths. They're not self-understood. Hitler didn't believe them. Stalin didn't believe them. This murderer in Pittsburgh didn't believe them. Turkmenistan didn't believe them. Pirate Pharaoh didn't believe them. Haman didn't believe them. These are not self-evident truths. These are truths that have been communicated through a certain ideal and value that really believes that we come from one source. Maybe we're not created equal. Maybe as Nietzsche said, the fact that I could means that I should. Survival of the fittest, 
The fact is that those who embrace evolution with such passion and such zest, and I must say many of my dear brothers, Jews, who embrace evolution with religious fervor, and somebody once told me Jews don't know how to be atheists, when they deny God, it's always with religious passion. It's a religion. <laughs> and that's why they will fight for it till the last drop of blood, even if it doesn't make that much sense. Because religion you fight for. Those are a lot of Jewish atheists I know. They have a unique Jewish flavor that defines their atheism. So from the Jewish perspective, we look at life, every day of life. There's meaning there. There's a story there. There's purpose there. It's not a random error which only makes the question great. How does one deal with faith in the presence of the Holocaust? And I'll be honest with you, it's a question not about the Holocaust, it's a question about every human tragedy. 11 Jews gunned down last Shabbos morning. Their only sin that they wanted to come to pray on Saturday morning, including a 97-year-old survivor. Why? Why? And the why extends to scores of stories and events that so many of you know of your personal lives, events that you experienced or heard about from the beginning of time. The first human beings, Adam and Eve, had to observe one child murdering another child, Cain murdering Abel. This is the great story of history. And people like giving explanations. You will read books. You will hear sermons. You will watch, observe websites or documentaries or films where people give explanations. And to be blunt, some of my colleagues, rabbinic figures, love giving explanations. And people have different explanations. Some blame events on sin. Some speak about reincarnation. Some speak about the future life. Some speak about this world just being a corridor. Some talk about the physical world being an illusion. The death of ego is the purpose of everything. Maya, nirvana, one and all, all in one. They say a Buddhist monk came into a hot dog stand in Borough Park. And the Jew says, what would you like? We have hot dogs. He says, make me, you know, we have hot dogs and mustard and sauerkraut and ketchup. The Buddhist monk says, make me one with everything. <laughs> Please explain that to your neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> when uh, it comes time to pay, when it comes time to pay, he gives him a $20 bill. And the Buddhist monk doesn't say any extra words, so he waits. After five minutes, the Jew says, what are you waiting for? He says, change. He says, change happens inside. <laughs> and yet, I will humbly say that I think the best answer to all these questions is the answer that's presented in Judaism time and time again. When I was younger, I didn't appreciate the answer so much. When I was older, I came to really appreciate it. And the answer is so good, it can be communicated in three words. We don't know. We really don't know. The book of Job, one of the great biblical books dedicated to the story of human suffering, embodies this exact theme. Job is a good man, suffers terribly, loses his children, loses his wealth, loses his health. He has three friends who come to console him. And what do three Jew friends do when they console him? They explain to him why God is punishing him. And Job refuses to accept it. He says, I'm not a sinner, I'm a good man. I never heard a fly. I'm not an evil person. I do not deserve this. And they rebuke him, and they scream at him, and they chastise him in the beautiful poetry of 42 chapters of the book of Job. And finally, after 37 chapters, God appears to Job. And we're waiting to hear the explanation. Why? 
And here it's not perpetrated by a Hitler, perpetrated by nature, i.e. by God. And what God tells Job is, I'm really upset at your friends. Your friends really have spoken inappropriately. Fascinating. He takes Job's side. Job, the one who defends himself and says, this didn't happen for sin. He takes Job's side. He says, I'm upset with your friends. They were dishonest. They did not speak inappropriately. As one of the great commentators, the Malvim says, God was telling Job, your friends were just doing religious lip service to me. They think I need a lawyer. It's like many Jews who always are busy defending God. They think God needs a lawyer. And they're always explaining and justifying and rationalizing. God said they don't even believe what they said. They were just afraid to talk about their real heart, what they're really feeling. At least you were honest. And then when Job wants to know the secret of his life, all God does is the classic Jewish thing. He answers questions with more questions. Two chapters, he speaks to Job and he asks questions. He starts off, Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Were you there with me when the first clouds were formed? When the first thunderstorm developed? Are you there with me when a mother gazelle has to give birth? When an elephant mother has to give birth? When a lioness has to birth her cubs? Are you there with me to create the first lightning, the oceans and the beaches? The entire ecosystem, the food chain, have you been there with me? What's this answer? It's basically one of the fundamental ideas of Judaism is don't expect a finite brain to ever be able to truly comprehend its creator which is infinite. I can't expect to take a three-year-old boy or girl, put them in a class on nuclear physics, and when the three-year-old comes out and says that was pretty boring, I will chastise them. You can't expect a three-year-old to understand a professor teaching university level of physics and that child may grow up one day to be more intelligent and knowledgeable than the professor. It's only a relative difference. But the gulf between the human mind and the divine mind is absolute. It's infinite. Some things we simply don't understand. We don't know. I don't know why so many tragedies happen. I don't know. I don't understand. And not only me, some of the greatest Jews in history were not afraid to ask the question. Abraham speaks to God and says, Will the judge of the world not behave with justice? Abraham, such chutzpah? Moses, Moses speaks to God and says, Why are you afflicting this people? Jeremiah, Why do the evil prosper? Job, David, the entire, all of the biblical books, the greatest believers ask the question. Because here we come to a fundamental point and that is, this question of why and how, can only come about if one actually believes there is a God who is not evil. If one feels this entire world is random, the question of why is a futile question. Why did the baby die? Why was this person born with a terminal illness? Why did this tragedy happen in the family? Why? Because cookies crumble in different ways. There's no rhyme and there's no reason. Things happen. As they used to say in yeshiva, spaghetti happens. It happens randomly. The fact that all of us, deep down in our hearts, when you hear about a tragedy by nature or perpetrated by people, you hear about an earthquake that claims lives, you hear about a hurricane or tsunami that claims lives, you hear about a tragedy in an individual family or a community, every heart, the heart of an agnostic, the heart of an atheist, the heart of a believer, cries out. And consciously or unconsciously we say to ourselves, why? That why, from a Jewish perspective, is one of the greatest proofs that God lives in every heart. That somehow we expect the world to be a beautiful place. That when we see acts of violence, when we see massacres or bloodbaths, when we hear of travesties or tragedies, something doesn't sit well in us because deep down we feel this world deserves better. 
If the world was conceived in love by a loving creator, why, why would you allow this? The very question, the very question is a testimony to profound faith. In fact, the truly secular person can't ask why. Why? Why not? Why not? It's only if I really accept that there's a God who's good that the question why makes sense. Which is why we're not surprised when people ask this question. Because deep down, the soul experiences the reality of God and therefore each person has that question. Because each person deep down has a spiritual aspect to them has a spiritual relationship to them, even if in talk shows and at debates and on YouTube videos, they love to deny it. But there's another component here. Think about the perpetrators. There was something unique about the Holocaust, unlike other tragedies. We're used to, when we read about this killer in Pittsburgh, what did he do for a living? So you'll read the articles, how he was a loner, he was a ghost, nobody knew him, some strange fellow. It fits the profile of a real loser who has nothing better to do than gun down 11 people in cold blood. Throughout history, we learn of barbaric, bar, 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 barbaric people, illiterates, uneducated people who celebrated bloodshed. But there was a uniqueness about the Holocaust. And the uniqueness was, it was perpetrated, conceived, contrived, executed by the nation that was considered the most sophisticated nation in modern times, the nation that produced the greatest amount of PhDs, won, I believe, the most Nobel Prizes, excelled in the arts and the humanities, in philosophy and even in ethics, never mind in science. It was a nation that believed in culture and education. It was a nation that during Holocaust in Auschwitz played Richard Wagner's music because they had a sensitivity to the richness of culture and to the diversity of the arts. You remember that scene in Schindler's List when the Krakow ghetto was liquidated and one little Jewish girl hides in a piano and she thinks the coast is clear and she comes out of the piano by mistake. Her little cute angelic foot hits those, those keys. And the SS guards on the bottom hear the sound of music. And with oomph and zealousness, they run up. They see a little girl in a red coat who just came out of the piano. And there's three guards, three SS men standing. And one sees a beautiful piano. And he's a pianist. He sits down to play the piano as his colleague shoots the girl dead. And as the girl falls down into a river of her own blood. His friend, the third one, turns to him, to the shooter, to the killer, pointing to the one by the piano, and says to him, Mozart! He looks at him in disdain, Nine Bach! How can you be such an illiterate person when it comes to music and not distinguish between a Mozart and a Bach? But that didn't stop them from murdering that child, which teaches us something very profoundly about history and about life. And that is, for more than a century, the philosophers of the Enlightenment taught that you can eliminate God from the face of the earth and people will be good based on their own reasoning, based on their own culture, based on their own nature. If you just allow people to govern their lives and societies based on their mind, and you give them the opportunity for research and scholarship, their higher angels will prevail. Came Nazi Germany, and a nation that produced the most educated masses, were capable of sending one and a half million children to the gas chambers. Because as the Ten Commandments understood, if you want to ingrain the low tirzach, thou shall not murder, you can't divorce it from the first commandment. There are laws of justice and ethics 
that are rooted not in my mood and my intelligence, but in an absolute divine source of morality. And when God was dismissed from the face of the planet, as Friedrich Nietzsche said, God is dead. Or as I saw somebody wrote graffiti on the subway, God is dead, signed, Nietzsche. And then under that, Nietzsche is dead, signed, God. <laughs> when they decided you can eliminate God, let people be enlightened, and our own enlightenment will allow us to become great people. Look at the lessons of Nazi Germany. Morality has to be educated. Don't take it for granted. It doesn't happen on its own. Children need to be educated that there's something called right, there's something called wrong, there's something called good, there's something called evil, and it doesn't depend only on my philosophy and my mood and my rationality and my justifications. It's rooted in an absolute source of morality. Or as Dostoevsky writes, if there's no God, everything is permitted. Everything becomes a matter of taste. Some people equate killing cockroaches with killing people. As I once heard somebody say on the radio, why are you making a differentiation? It's all about what I like, what my mood is, what my feelings are. But if we could take this to the next step and speak about what Jews, some of the lessons that Jews can learn, can discover from this great tragedy that happened just one generation ago. And as I once had a student who used to tell me, Rabbi Jacobson, the Holocaust happened two mortgages ago. That was his way of making it palpable two mortgages ago of what we as Jews can learn today from this with a profound relevance for today's day and age. Very often we look at our brothers and sisters and we misunderstand the uniqueness of the Jewish people. And sometimes we have to learn from our enemies. May Oivai Techakmeni King David says, My enemies make me smart. Sometimes my enemies make me wise. They teach me truths that I often cannot see within myself. What am I referring to? I'm referring to the fact of who was targeted 75 years ago during the Holocaust. Jews were divided then as they're still divided today. There were communists. There were capitalists, there were Zionists, there were anti-Zionists. There were Bundists who despised Judaism, despised it. And there were ultra-religious Jews, Hasidic Jews, observant Jews in Russia, in Poland, in Lithuania, in Ukraine, in Hungary, in Galicia, and in all of Eastern Europe. There were Jews who maintained our heritage, our Torah, with oomph and passion and diligence and commitment. And there were Jews who saw themselves as assimilated and integrated in mainstream society, intermarried and completely integrated, some who even converted to another religion. And yet, for Hitler and the Germans, none of them could be speared. Each of them was targeted with equal venom and equal hatred. Each one of them was seen as the vermin of the earth. And one wonders, how can you hate a little baby? A one-year-old Jewish child, a two-year-old, three-year-old Jewish child, they're not communists. There's no territorial dispute. They're little babies. There's a universal feeling that we have to babies whether it's our family, or our race, our people or not. How can you have such a hate to a child? How? How does that happen? Haman had the same thing. Hitler had a good teacher, Hama. In the Megillah, in the book of Esther, Purim, he says he wants to destroy every single Jewish child. Every last child. Why this hatred to a child? Why the hatred to a Jew is assimilated? The Jew says, I'm not Jewish. I don't believe in it. I'm not interested in it. 
I'm not that person. I'm not a rabbi. I'm not a tzaddik. I'm not a rebbe. I'm not a Rosh Hashiva. I'm not in this whole, I'm not in this system. I don't even believe in this system. But there is a very profound truth here. And that is that Hitler and the Nazis despised every Jew with equal hatred because ultimately the holiness of the Jewish soul is identical in every single Jew. A Jew is a Jew is a Jew. No matter if he or she calls himself Involved or not involved, religious or secular, ultra religious or ultra secular, right wing or left wing, centrist facing right, centrist facing left, ultra, ultra, ultra left, ultra, ultra, ultra right. However, you define yourself, however, you see yourself, deep down, we are all one. We are all brothers and sisters. Every Jew carries. The genes, the history, and the holiness of the Jewish people from Sinai till this day. And our enemies, those who hate us, therefore don't distinguish. Because they see in every Jew the full majesty, the full grandeur of the Jewish people. And here is the rule of history. We are the miners' canaries of history. When miners got to go mining, they don't go down into the mines before they send the canary birds. The canary birds are sensitive to noxious fumes. If they don't come back, you don't go down. If the canaries come back, you're safe. The canaries will always be affected first by the poison in the mines. Jews are the miners' canaries of history. Look at any society. If there are noxious fumes, Jews will be targeted first, but never last. Stalin despised Jews, but it didn't end with Jews. He killed 50 million of his own people. Hitler hated Jews more than everybody else, but he only started with Jews. The suicide bombers of the Islamists started with Israel. And everyone said, it's Israel, the bus is blowing up. The suicide bombings at Sabara pizzas, in yeshivas, in basketball fields, in synagogues, on Egged buses, is an Israeli problem. And then came September 11. And then came Madrid. And then came Mumbai. And then came so many other countries and cities. It starts with Jews. It never ends with Jews. It starts with Jews because somehow we always attract first the venom and the poison of hatred, of anti-Semitism, which is not only about anti-Semitism. It always results in the abuse of human rights. Look at any country. This is a litmus test. Look at any country in the world, if you want to know if it's a good country to live in, ask yourself one question, and this worked for the last 4,000 years, how they treat Jews. Iran despises Jews, but how do they abuse their own minorities? Syria despises Jews, but what do they do to their own citizens? Countries that are cruel to Jews end up being cruel to all good people. Jews are just targeted first. We're the miners' canaries. That's why God told Abraham, those who bless you will be blessed. Those who curse you will be cursed. This is not just a blessing. It's a prediction of history. If you want to know if a country is blessed or cursed, look at one issue. Do they bless the Jews or do they curse the Jews? Hitler! Yemach Shemai felt in his bones the holiness of the Jew and evil despises goodness. Evil wants to destroy goodness. And where did he feel that goodness? In every single Jew. Every man, woman, child. If there's Jewish blood flowing through your veins, there is a holiness and goodness that drives the Hitlers of the universe mad. And they can't sleep. If this baby still exists. They can't sleep if this baby exists. This teaches us a very profound lesson. We sometimes look at certain Jews and we say, eh, you're not Jewish enough. You're not holy enough. Very nice. Very nice. <laughs> Who's that guy? <laughs> Send it to my mother in law. <laughs> Please. We sometimes look at other Jews 
And we say, eh, you're not holy enough for me. You're not religious enough for me. You're not as Jewish as me. The Holocaust should teach us that that approach is simply wrong. For Hitler, no Jew was too small, too insignificant, not enough Jewish. He was ready to hunt them down in hate, every last one. In fact, he ruined his chances of victory because so many resources he utilized to exterminate the Jews, which was not rational. You're fighting a war on many fronts. Use those resources to win your war. But he knew what his priority was, what his agenda is. Now I ask you and me and all of us, should we be any different and not hunt down every Jew in love? And not look at every single Jew as our brother, as our sister, as our flesh, as our blood? not have the ability to embrace and hug and celebrate every one of our people, even if we disagree. And as Jews, I promise you, we will disagree for a very long time. I once heard from my Rebbe, he said, why is it that in Hebrew, I greet you, Shalom Aleichem, and you say, Aleichem Shalom. Peace on to you, on to you, peace. Why not respond reciprocally? Shalom Aleichem, Shalom Aleichem. Imagine in English I say, good evening, and you say, evening good. <laughs> how are you? You are how? <laughs> What's up? Up what? Guys, Meshige. Guys, nuts. But in Hebrew we do it all the time. Shalom Aleichem. No, Aleichem Shalom. Topsy turvy. And the answer he said was because when two Jews meet, even before they start talking, when they're just greeting each other, they already have to disagree. <laughs> I say Shalom Aleichem, and you say, Nah, come on, Narish kite nonsense, stupidity. Aleichem Shalom. <laughs> now, once we establish that we disagree, we know that we're both Jewish. <laughs> None of us have to convert. And we could continue having a conversation, hopefully peaceful. There's a fellow, a great Kabbalist, his name is Jackie Mason. <laughs> He's the guy who repeats most of my jokes. And uh, I heard from him once that uh, if two Jews meet and within four minutes they don't establish a family connection, I know your first cousin, I'm your third cousin twice removed, I knew your mother-in-law from her third marriage. If, if, if we don't establish a family connection within four or five minutes, one of them is not Jewish. <laughs> And it happens all the time, yeah? Oh, of course, Toronto, yeah, my brother, yeah, I know, I know them, of course. I meet something, I go to Australia, people say, you're from New York, yeah, you must know my cousin in New York. So, of course, who doesn't know your cousin? Only three million Jews there. <laughs> you must know my cousin, of course I know your cousin. Not only that, I'm waiting for them to pay back my loan. <laughs> Maybe you can do it instead of that. But I would add that if you meet another Jew and within a few minutes, you don't get into an argument. One of you is probably not Jewish. <laughs> Which is why today I chose to leave the United States of America and come to Canada because we have a very heated day over there. A lot of, a lot of shalom aleichems and aleichem shalom's, but not as funny and as peaceful always as we're making it, but it's a hot, passionate day of uh, the elections, so I decided to come to Canada. And uh, I, <laughs> I thank you for welcoming me. <laughs> now, <laughs> but you know, there's something very comforting about this thought too, and I have to share this with you. Often, we look at ourselves in the mirror, and we say, am I really the same Jew Am I a continuation of those same Jews who stood at Mount Sinai 3,300 years ago? I mean, do I have any connection to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, Leah, Moses, Joshua, King David, King Solomon, Samson? How about Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, Rabbi Meir, Rabbi Shimon, Rabbi Judah the Prince, Rashi, Maimonides, the Ariza, the Baal Shem Tev. I mean... We live in a different climate, in a different milieu, in a different world. The connection seems to be maybe just about nostalgia. And as somebody once told me, eh, 
Nostalgia is not what it used to be like. <laughs> so yes, we can repeat our statements. We could celebrate the Seder. We can come to shul. We could do the traditions. We can even eat knedlach. But is there a real connection? But friends, let's look at the facts. And that is sad, but also very, very comforting. We are hated by those who hate Jews the same way like our ancestors were hated 100 years ago, 500 years ago, 1,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago. This man who walked into the tree of life last Shabbos in the morning and gunned down 11 Jews in the tree of life in Pittsburgh, where I've spent many a summer, and where many of my cousins were bar mitzvah and bat mitzvah in the tree of life of Binden. And while he was gunning them down, all he could say is, all Jews deserve to die. Why do all Jews deserve to die? Why do all Jews deserve to die? Why do so many people believe that? Why is the blood libel that we use, Muslim blood for our matzah on Passover, still a common, common idea and truth in Muslim countries? What is this? But one thing remains, and that's what we have to realize. We are the same Jews who stood at Sinai. We are the same Jews who lived in Babylonia and who lived in the Holy Land and who lived in Europe throughout all of the years of the diaspora. We are not only a continuation, we don't only carry their genes and chromosomes. This is the same people. We still attract the same venom. You know why? Because we still embody the same holiness of God's people. The ambassadors of the divine, ambassadors of love, light, hope, and sacredness. And it's the ambassadors of the divine that are being targeted because nobody likes their alarm clock. Do you know anybody who falls in love with their alarm clock? We don't like alarm clocks. And Jews historically have been the alarm clocks of civilization. People don't like alarm clocks consciously or unconsciously. But finally, my friends, there is one more component when we speak about faith and the Holocaust and its lessons. And this brings us to a vision. There was a prophet, Ezekiel. And Ezekiel, I think in chapter 36 or 37, has the prophecy that we read after Passover. On Passover, it's called the prophecy of the dry bones. Atzamot. God takes Ezekiel the prophet and he observed the destruction of the first temple. He was in Babylonia, present day Iraq. He takes him to a valley. The valley is filled with dry bones. And he says, what do you see? Son of man, what do you see? And he says, I see dry bones. And he says, can these bones come to life? And Ezekiel says, you know God. And then suddenly, these bones are infused with a spirit. And they grow flesh. And the dry bones come to life. And God tells Ezekiel, this is going to be the story of your people. And one wonders, what is the meaning of this prophecy? And yet, we have the privilege of saying the truth in our own way. Notwithstanding the tremendous pain and horrors our people existed, we have seen some of this prophecy come true in our own times. A little while ago, I spoke with the chief rabbi of Berlin. Berlin, Berlin, Germany. He's a friend of mine. We were classmates in yeshiva. His name is Rabbi Yehuda Tachtel. And uh, Rabbi Tachtel shared with me that he went to meet the president of Germany. Frank Walter Steinemer, who was the present president of Germany, to discuss the commemoration of 80 years since Kristallnacht. Kristallnacht broke out on November 9th, 1938. That's exactly 80 years ago. Exactly. 
and he was discussing with the president of Germany what is the appropriate way to commemorate it. That night, when hundreds, some say thousands of Jews were beaten and murdered, thousands of synagogues and Jewish shops and homes were torched and destroyed, thousands upon thousands of Jews sent to concentration camps. That day, when in many ways the Holocaust began, even if the war itself only started on the 17th of Elul, September 1st, 1939. And Rabbi Tachtel, who was a Chabad rabbi of Berlin, is discussing with President Steinemer of Germany how to commemorate it. And what the president tells him is, the 80th anniversary of Kristallnacht is going to be shortly before Hanukkah. This is what I want to do. I want that we, Germany, should erect a huge menorah. Where? By the, what is it called, the gate? Uh, huh? Brandenburg. Gate. We'll erect a big menorah. And I want to have the privilege, as the president of this country, to light it. And Rabbi Tachtel is sharing this with me. I said, so what are you going to do? He said, of course I'm going to do it. The president is going to light the shamash. He's going to light the shamash of the menorah. And we're going to light the menorah. And I thought to myself, imagine. There are those pictures and those videos of Hitler's speeches that he gave at that Brandenburg Gate. Of all the motorcades, all the parades, the Hitler Youth, the thousands and thousands of Germans saluting hail to the Fuhrer, where the souls of hatred and genocide were planted and inculcated in the hearts of millions. And 80, 75, 80 years later, the president of Germany wants this Hanukkah menorah to stand there. And he wants to go up on that uh, cherry picker and light that menorah. And then I remember that story that happened in a city called Kiel. Kiel, Germany. K-I-E-L, Germany. In 1931, the last night of Hanukkah was Friday night, Shabbat. The rabbi of Kiel, which numbered only 500 Jews from the half a million Jews in Germany, was a man named Rabbi Posner. Rabbi Akiva Baruch Posner. And before Shabbat comes in, he lights the menorah. All eight candles. He has it on his windowsill, and there's eight candles ready to greet the Shabbat. This is the last evening night of Hanukkah. His wife, about to go light Shabbos candles, her name is Rachel Posner, takes a picture in 1931 of the menorah burning moments before Shabbat. Why does she take the picture? She takes a picture which I have seen because right across the street is the headquarters of the Nazi party in Kiel. And there's a huge swastika on the building. So as the menorah is on the windowsill in the background, you see a huge swastika in the picture. And Rachel Posner in 1931 writes on the other side of the picture these words. She writes, Judea will die, says the swastika. And she continues, Judea will outlive them and live for eternity, says the menorah. That's the picture. <laughs> Rabbi and Rabbi Posner urged their community to leave kill in the 30s, which is why I think almost the entire community of Kiel was saved, including they themselves, they came to Israel. Every Hanukkah, right before Hanukkah, there's a Jew who lives in Haifa, his name is Yehuda. He is a grandson of the Posners. And Yad Vashem Museum delivers to him that menorah that made it to Israel. And he lights it with his children and grandchildren for those eight days holding the picture, that original picture that his grandmother took in 1931, a few minutes before Shabbat. Judaism will outlive them and live forever, thus says the menorah. 
At that point, it was hard to believe. But today, as you look at that picture, you look at that menorah, and you say, who triumphed? The president of Germany asked the Chabad, Rabbi, he wants to have the merit to light the menorah the Brandenburg Brigade on the first night of Hanukkah. And you have to ask the question, where is Pharaoh? Where is Sancheirev? Where is Haman? Where is Nebuchadnezzar? Where is Tolkamadei? Where is Kmolonetsky? Where is Stalin? Where is Goebbels, Rosenberg, Eichmann, and Himmler, and Mengele? Where are they? And the answer is, they are in Wikipedia. And we are the Jewish people. And the answer is, we created Wikipedia. <laughs> And if you want, you can take out any of their names, Google their names, and edit them. You can edit Pharaoh, you can edit Haman, but it's not only we edit them on Wikipedia. We also wanted to transform them, so we took Haman and we turned them into a Hamantash. And we took Antiochus and we turned them into a Latka. We took Pharaoh and we turned them into a Matzah ball. We don't only want to outlive them, we want them to contribute to our cholesterol. <laughs> to our growth, to our health, to our obesity, and to our love for food. Last Hanukkah, I was near Brooklyn College, they wanted to know, this Irish president wanted, why do you eat so many latkes and donuts on Hanukkah? I said, it's simple. Hanukkah is the victory of Jews against the Greeks. The Greeks were into a few things, fashion, books, sports, exercise, athleticism. So we eat donuts and latkes to make sure we never ever will look like that. <laughs> you know, friends, my dearest friends, A little while ago, a rabbi in Israel by the name of Rabbi Yitzchak David Grossman, he's the rabbi of Migdal HaEmek, is visited by an Israeli fellow, a man named Dani Atom. He's the head of the regional council of the Upper Galilee. He comes into Rabbi Grossman and he says, I was in Germany a few weeks ago. And in Germany I met a member of the German parliament. His name is Ditlib Herzog. And he approaches me. And he says, my father died a few weeks ago. He gave me something. Here it is. A wallet. Why? So my father was on his deathbed. And I was there. This is what the German parliament member is telling Dani Atom from Israel in Germany. And he says, my father looks at me and says, before I die, I have to make a confession. I was a member of the Luftwaffe. I was a member of Hitler's Air Force. And I was a member of the Wehrmacht, of the army, the German army. And the day I got a certificate that I was accepted in the Air Force was very exciting for me. And I was looking for a nice, sophisticated wallet to be able to place my certificate in. That day... We burnt down a synagogue. And as we were burning the synagogue, I saw on the floor of the synagogue this very expensive and cool, nice parchment. And I said, that's good for my wallet. And I went and I tore off a piece of parchment and I fashioned it into a wallet. And I placed my certificate of the army inside of it. And I always carried it with me. But I learned then that this was a sacred item for the Jewish people in the synagogue. And I'm about to die, I feel bad. Take it and deliver it to the holiest Jew in Israel. And he gives it to his son, Ditlib Herzog, parliament member, who gives it to Dani Atom, who comes to Rabbi Grossman back in Israel and says, as far as I'm concerned, you're the holiest Jew in Israel. Here is the wallet. Rabbi Grossman, holding onto the wallet, opens it up. And he could feel right away, this is the cloth. This is a parchment of a Sefer Torah, of a Torah scroll. 
And then he calls over Daniel Tom and he says, there are words. And let me tell you which words. And Rabbi Grossman shows him that this Nazi, this, S, this man, tore off the Torah in the book of Deuteronomy, the end of Parshat Kitavo, the beginning of Parshat Nitzavim. The end of Kitavo is the portion where there are many sharp rebukes against the Jewish people about the possible dispersion and persecution of the people. And then it continues, Atem Nitzavim Hayom Kulchem, you stand here today before your God. And Rabbi Grossman tells Dani Atom, Rashi writes there, that what Moses was telling the Jewish people is that the Jewish people heard all these warnings and they started to be petrified that they will perish, they will not survive. So Moses says, you are standing here like the day, just like the sun doesn't disappear. It sets, but then it rises again. You will never disappear. After sunset will always come sunrise. This was the portion that this Nazi turned into a wallet for his certificate of the Wehrmacht or the Luftwaffe that came back to Rabbi Grossman in Israel. And I thought to myself, if you were standing in that shul, if you were a fly on the wall in that synagogue in 1941 or 42, observing Jews being burnt alive, as a Jew from Auschwitz told me, he says the life of a Jew was less significant than the life of a rat. It meant nothing. It meant absolutely nothing. The torture, the sadism, the barbarity, the hatred. I'm finishing reading now a book by an Auschwitz survivor, Dr. Edith Ager, The Choice. Anybody saw the book? The Choice, Edith Ager. Some scenes that she describes, and your blood boils. And if you would be a fly on that wall and you would see Jews burnt. The Torah's strewn on earth. We come, we bring out the Sefer Torahs in the shul and everybody, mwah, 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 mwah. Simchas Torah, we dance. But for the Germans, it was on the floor, stepped on with their boots and their mud. And then he tears it off and turns it into a wallet. Every Jewish heart would shudder if this was done. Even if you don't, you're not a regular attendee in a synagogue. And if you were standing and observing this, you and every normal person would come to the conclusion, Judea is dead. Judaism is dead. We fought long, we survived long, but we have breathed our last breath. Seven and a half decades later, that wallet comes to one of the great rabbis in Israel today, Rav Grossman. And he opens it up and it says, you may experience sunset, but the sun will always rise again. And even if it's cloudy, there's always the sun above the clouds. And even when the sun sets over the horizon, it doesn't disappear. There is rebirth. 75 years later, 6.6 .6 million Jews live in Israel today. Let that number not go unnoticed. 6.6 .6 million Jews live in Israel today in our eternal homeland. And that Torah scroll came back to the rabbi. And he looked at it and Moses says, you will stand here for eternity. If that is not a miracle, what is a miracle? Some time ago, Israel released the name of the man who executed Adolf Eichmann. For many years, his name was concealed because they were afraid that neo-Nazis will take revenge. His name is Shalom Nagar, a Yemenite Jew who was in charge to provide security for Eichmann when he was captured by the Mossad from the streets of Buenos Aires in 1961, brought to Israel, tried, hung, cremated. Mr. Nagar, a Yemenite Jew with long payas, side locks, dark Yemenite complexion, was the man who did it. He hung him, he cremated him, and then took his ashes to be scattered in the waters of the Mediterranean, three miles away from Israel. They didn't want to have his ashes in the territory of Israel. They wanted to place it in international waters. And 50 or 60 years later, Israel revealed his name. And I was reading that one of the German TVs, one of the German TV networks came to interview Shalom Kenagar to tell them about the last days of Eichmann. And they asked him, can we interview you? And he said, yes. 
They said, we have a beautiful studio in Tel Aviv. Beautiful German kept, kept clean, neat studio. He says, no, no. You want to interview me? Shalom Nagar today is in his 80s. And he learns Torah full time in a kolel, in a yeshiva in Israel. That's where he sits and learns Torah. You'll come interview me there. So the crew came into this yeshiva, this kolel, and with all due respect, but these houses of worship in Israel are not always yekish style. <laughs> the yekis are good at being neat and organized and clean, but if you go into a Jewish kolel, it's usually a mess. First of all, the books are torn. Second of all, the books are all over the place. Third of all, there's people arguing. They're always arguing in these yeshivas. It's like, no, you don't know what you're talking about, but this is what he means, not what he means. Second of all, if there's coffee, there's no milk. There's milk, there's no cups. This cup, there's no spoons. There's spoons, there's no sugar. There's sugar, there's no hot water. You never get everything. Then there's always a guy who decided this is his house. So he sleeps there. He sleeps in the shul. He has a little house under the table with a refrigerator and a freezer and a mattress. And then there's another guy who's competing with him over that house. Then there's somebody who's making a kiddush for his mother-in-law's yard site. Somebody else who's preparing for a bar mitzvah, a bas mitzvah, an aliyah. Two people argue. One guy is giving a class. There's a minion finishing davening. You know how these places are. Not German style. <laughs> and they look at him and they say, could we just do the interview in this quiet studio? And he says, no, here or nowhere. They don't have a choice. They do the interview there. And Nagar answers their questions. Very fascinating story about Eichmann, the security that Israel provided for Eichmann, out of fear that somebody will kill Eichmann before, before the trial is completed and before the verdict is given and before justice is meted out to the architect of the final solution. And Nagar says that Eichmann was under such tight security, he was placed behind five chambers, one, two, three, four, five, and in each one there were security guards. Access to him was almost impossible. All the food that was given to Eichmann, Mr. Nagar had to eat first because they were afraid somebody would poison him. And Nagar asked the head of the Mossad, he said, I don't understand. If there's poison there, then I'm going to die. <laughs> and the head of the Mossad told him, well, for you, I have a replacement. <laughs> for Eichmann, the monster, there's no replacement. So paradoxically, protecting his life was, became the role, his role. And he did his job well. And then came the fateful night, and he hung him. He remained an unrepentant murderer. His last words, long live Germany and hail. I'm not going to conclude the sentence. But he remained completely loyal to his boss, to the Fuhrer. Completely wholesome with his life's work of eliminating gassing six million innocent human beings just because they were Jewish. He died, he was cremated, his ashes scattered. And Nagar tells the whole story in detail. Finally, the interviewer asks him on this German TV show, why did you choose to do the interview in this place where there's so much commotion and noise? Why couldn't we go to our beautiful studio in Tel Aviv? And Nagar, a classic Yemenite Jew, not politically correct, not very diplomatic, pretty blunt type of guy, responds, and I have to say I was reading his response, and I quelled, I, I, I appreciated it, I enjoyed it. And he said, I'll tell you why, I know that this interview is going to be watched by millions and millions of Germans. We could have done it in your neat studio, and then you would have seen a studio with a Jew. I wanted to show all your people, it's not only the Jewish people survived in their body. I wanted to show you that Jewish culture, Jewish faith, Jewish heritage, Jewish scholarship, Jewish learning survived. I wanted your people should see the commotion. They should see all the books are torn. You know why they're torn? Because they're used, because they're studied. I wanted them to see the arguments. Our culture is alive, our faith is alive, our Torah is alive, our mitzvahs are alive, our traditions are alive. I wanted them to see that our synagogues, our centers, our study halls are vibrant. I wanted them to see we didn't only survive with our bodies, we survived with our souls because the Germans wanted to destroy not only the Jewish body, but also the Jewish soul, Jewish pride, Jewish dignity, Jewish culture, Jewish faith. When they came into Lublin, one of the great cities in Poland that housed one of the largest yeshivas in Eastern Europe, Yeshiva Chachme Lublin, the building still stands. 
If you go to Lublin, Yeshiva Chachme Lublin, and it had one of its great, the greatest Jewish libraries, 25 or 30,000 books from before the war. And the SS forced the Jews to build a fire and to take the books with their own hands and throw it into the fire to add insult to injury. And the story goes, it wasn't enough. They told the Jews, now sing. Don't only burn your books, but sing when you burn your books. Let's see you really downtrodden. And one of the Jews took a song, an old Yiddish romantic song about a husband and a wife who get into a fight. It doesn't only happen in Canada, it happened in Poland too. <laughs> And he looks and she's ignoring him. And you know when a Jewish wife ignores a husband, it kills the guy. I mean, we make believe we're macho. But we're not. And she's just ignoring him. She gives him that, you know, cold treatment. And there's nothing as hot as the cold treatment of your wife. There's nothing that stings and bites. Like when your wife is angry at you, especially when it's passive aggressive. <laughs> Meaning you're not even worth the passion. You're not even worth being screamed at. Any men know what I'm talking about? Okay, they're all nodding. Wow, that's wonderful. You could call me if you need help. And so, there's a Yiddish song, a romantic Yiddish song. The husband turns to the wife and says, Let's stop this nonsense. Let's make up with each other. Let's stop holding grudges. That's the song. It's a very cute Yiddish love song, essentially. The Jew in Lublin converted the lyrics. And he put new lyrics spontaneously. Master of the world, we will outlive them. And as books are being burnt, the Jews are singing, we will outlive them. First, the SS can't understand why they're excited. But when they listen closely, they discover that in their singing, they promise themselves and their children, we will outlive them. So Shalom Kenagar tells the German crew, I wanted to show you that we are wholesome, not only in our physical survival, but also with our spiritual survival. With our spiritual survival. In 1990, friends, communism fell. And one of the countries that doors opened up to Judaism was Hungary, under the communist regime since the revolution in the mid-50s. And a few Jewish activists went down to Budapest and they opened up a Jewish day school. And they put a little ad in the paper and they hoped maybe five, 10, 20 Jewish parents will come. On the first day, 400 Jewish parents came to look at the school, to think about enrolling their children, and they didn't know what to do. Were they going to get classrooms, teachers, curriculums, books? This was shocking. So they split up the activists. They started to interview every set of parents to see, you know, what they want, how they could service them. One of the fathers was there. He came with his little girl. And they asked the father, what brings you here? What brings you here? And this is what the father said. This is what he said. That I was a little boy. We were living in Budapest in 1944. My family was very assimilated. We were Hungarian and our neighbors didn't know we were Jewish. It was bedtime and I was sent to bed. I was six years old. I was six years old. But I heard my father and mother having a heated conversation. You remember when you're six and you hear Tati and Mommy having a heated conversation, you crawl out of bed and you go to the door and you listen. And I hear my mother telling my father, the Germans took Hungary. It's 1944, the deportations began. What if they would discover we're Jewish? And my father told my mom, you don't have to worry. We have a Hungarian name. There's no sign of Judaism in this home. Nobody knows us as Jewish. We have been assimilated for a very long time. We're good to go. 
Mother says to father, but what if they search our home and they find Jewish articles here? Father says, there's nothing here. There's no Judaism in this house. The books are not Jewish. The books are Hungarian. And mother climbs up to the top of a bookcase. She takes the ladder. She goes to the top of the bookcase. And the boy is looking through the, the, the peephole of the door. And she takes down a book. It was the book of Tehillim, the book of Psalms. Later I would find out that that's the book that her mother gave her on the day of her wedding. She gave her a book of Tehillim, a book of Psalms, one of the books of the Bible written by King David. And she showed it to my father. And she said, what about this? And my father said, let me see it. And she gave it to my father. And without skipping a heart's beat, he took the book and he threw it into the fireplace. And within 10 seconds, it was reduced to ashes. And my mother broke down sobbing. I didn't understand why she was crying. He burnt a book. I was six. I was a little boy, six or seven. Later, I would learn that probably she was sobbing because this was the last link that my parents had with their Jewish past. And for my mother, it represented the end. The last chain in the link was severed. The last cord, the last connection was eliminated. It demonstrated to her the sadness of it all. I went to bed. I couldn't fall asleep because I hear my mother crying most of the night. He looks at the rabbis in 1990, and he said, since that night, whenever I go to sleep, I still hear my mother sobbing. The war ended, we were not deported. I was alive, my mother was alive, my father was alive. We integrated into Hungarian culture, but every night I hear my mother sobbing and I find no rest. When I saw the ad in your newspaper that you are opening a Jewish school, I thought maybe I could bring my child here and have them read the book of Tehillim, the book of Psalms, so that my mother's tears at last can be dried up. The dry bones, my friends, have come to life. 75 years ago, all we saw were piles of ashes. If you go today to Treblinka, you will see piles of ashes. And yet, one day, the story will be told about this generation, the generation of Anita and her colleagues, who from the ashes constructed families, communities. Most Jews left Auschwitz, Treblinka, Belzec, Dachau, Matthausen, Bergen-Belsen, and those few survivors went, and most of them decided they're going to get married. They rebuilt Israel, and they rebuilt Judaism the world over. They built families and businesses. They built communities. Were they perfect? Absolutely not. Was there trauma in many of the homes? Absolutely yes. Can you expect anything less? But look at this miracle. Instead of becoming suicide bombers, instead of dedicating their life to hate, to despondency, to depression, they decided to build a Jewish future, to create a Jewish renaissance. And every one of us sitting in this room and the world over is a product of that miracle. They blew in spirit to the dry bones. They were dry bones, literally. Some of you know the pictures and the films of what the Jewish Muslim looked like on the day of liberation in January or April or May 1945 when the Soviets and the Americans and the British liberated them. They were dry bones, literally. And yet they blew life into those bones. They refused to surrender. They refused to despair. They became committed to rebuilding the flame, the torch of the Jewish people, of the Jewish homeland, of the Jewish heritage and the Jewish faith. And as we stand today, seven and a half decades later, this is a clarion call that this baton, this torch that they gave over to us, to you and I, we should never abandon. We should never neglect. 
We're blessed to live in times of freedom and opportunity and prosperity. It's easy to forget who you are, what you represent, and how much blood, sweat, tears, joy, and laughter was invested in this story. Tonight, we not only express thanks to that great generation, perhaps the greatest generation of the Jewish people, but not only a thanks, also a commitment, a dedication to ensure that that spirit and that soul, that that heritage and that faith, that that tradition and that Yiddishkeit lives on through us for eternity. Thank you very much. This class is brought to you by the yeshiva.net. Please help us continue the classes. Make even a small contribution at www.theyeshiva.net slash donate.